myself and Anatom Chandra to the Mellon Sawyer series in Surveillance and Democracy. This is our last month of the series, so please, uh, please enjoy. We're enjoying it. We wanted also to thank Karen Kaplan for organizing this event today, and Wen Lei and Chris Fallon. Thank you guys. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Derek Gregory, who has told me that I need to keep myself very short because he'd like to talk a little bit longer. Um, he is the Peter Wall Distinguished Professor of Geography at the University of British Columbia. His research is focused on historical geography of industrialization and the relations between social theory and human geography, processes of historical and geographical change, looking specifically at periods of crisis and transformation. This work shows us how to place space and landscape, how, how we place space and landscape, and how we've been involved in the operation and the outcomes of social processes. Um, he is extremely prolific researcher and writer, and I recount five books and three to come, so seven books in total, and I won't go into details about them. I also count three careers, or at least three phases um, in his work. It all seem to enrich and inform his most current work. I'll just give you a brief uh, description of some of those phases. His first work uh, deals mostly with the challenge of the way we understand and organize space, and he's He's sort of been a pioneer in calling for the development of critical human geography. His earlier work was interested in industrial capitalism, in industrialization of Britain, the factory system, and um, the change from domestic uh, capitalism into a more global model. And that sort of carried him over into a second phase where he was largely influenced by post-colonial critique and the discourse of Orientalism. There, he worked on uh, the Dictionary of Human Geography and uh, coined the term geographical imaginations, in which he was mostly interested in travel writing, particularly in uh, modes of documentation that produced a unique type of travel culture. He took his work to the third phase, the third shift, after the uh, uh, terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on September 11th. And this brought his work to more contemporary resonances um, that had to do with uh, mostly a rethinking of uh, current terror and the uh, history of colonialism. And that we hope to see that he'll have two books coming having to do with the questions of war. One has to do with a longer study of how we got to where we are and sort of thinking about the nature of war and the various campaigns. And the second, which he's going to talk a little bit about today, has to do with the, um, the reach from the sky aerial violence. So please join me in welcoming Derek. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's really, really nice to be here. And what I want to do today is to explore one study drawn from a larger project called, indeed, Reach from the Sky, Aerial Violence, and the Everywhere War. And I want to begin by acknowledging that today there is a discussion about drones and drone warfare on this campus, which operates under the title of Eyes in the Skies. And I begin there because of a meeting I had in London in May 2010, in a hotel next to King Cro King's Cross Station, where Guy Hibbert, shown there on the screen, wanted to talk with me about a script he was writing for BBC television. And it concerned a drone strike executed in East Africa. That script eventually morphed into Eye in the Sky. Although I've met Guy Hibbert, I have to say that, to my eternal regret, I have yet to meet Helen Mirren. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just stop there. <laughs> now, this film interests me for all sorts of reasons. It's a film which I think repays close scrutiny, and a film which repays reading alongside Andrew Nichols' Good Kill. But what's interesting about this film, from my point of view this morning, 
is summarized in these two reviews of it. The first by K. McFarlane, who says that I in the sky, the contrast here is with Goodkill, goes granular, telling the story of one particular mission on one particular day, across eight locations, seven of which are operating thousands of miles away from the actual site. And what I want to do today is indeed to go granular, and also to say a great deal about that last clause, about the geography of militarized vision, those locations scattered over space. But secondly, I'm interested in David Cole's perceptive review, in which he concedes that it's hard to imagine knowing as much about any actual drone strike as we do about the fictional one depicted in Eye in the Sky. Well, hard to imagine, maybe. But if you dig, you can actually end up knowing even more about one particular drone strike. So that's what I plan to do today, to explore one particular drone strike across a whole series of different locations, um, and in, I hope, forensic detail. Now, I've called this Angry Eyes, and I will explain at the very end why I called it that. But I also refer to the God Trick. And here, of course, I'm inspired by the work of Donna Haraway, who objected to the fantasy of the God Trick, the prospect of seeing everything from nowhere. And it's a God Trick which is repeated endlessly in 21st century warfare. Though I have to say, it's a pretense which you can trace right the way back through the 20th and even into the 19th century. This is simply one example. It's an imaginative reconstruction by the video artist James Bridle called The Light of God. And he's referring in particular to the laser designation of a target, the ability of today's predators and reapers to fix a target on the ground with a laser designator. And that the Marines on the ground call the Light of God. This light that looks like it's coming from heaven Omar Fass was told by one drone operator, right on the spot, coming out of nowhere. And I use that particular example because what's lost in all of this discussion about drones, well, many, many things are lost, I think, but what's missing from most people's view is precisely what's happening on the ground. So, to make good on all those claims, I need to begin by saying something more generally about military violence in Afghanistan. The per first point to make is that most <coughs> civilian casualties in Afghanistan are the result of airstrikes. That's been true ever since the invasion in 2001, right the way through, as you can see in this image from the nation, till 2012. And if we look at those airstrikes, focusing on a period from 2006 to 2011, and here borrowing on the marvelous work of Jason Lyle, what we find is that, not surprisingly, most of those airstrikes are concentrated along the diffuse, indeterminate border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and most of all, in the south. If we zoom in even more tightly, what we find is that remarkably few of those airstrikes have been carried out by remotely piloted aircraft. Now, I make that point it's not an easy point to make because, as you can see, if you compare the top and the middle image, U.S. Central Command, for some reason, within a week, removed the separate tally of airstrikes carried out by predators and reapers. The fact of the matter is, between 2009 and 2012, anywhere between 5 and 10% of strikes were carried out directly by these uh, remote platforms. And I make that point because... The drone lobby focuses on airstrikes carried out by drones. And I understand that up to a point, but why don't they worry about the other 90%? If we're really concerned about civilian casualties, then we need to look at the totality of military violence in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Now, one reason to focus on them is that it turns out that during the crucial period that I'm looking at, those platforms were 10 times more likely to cause civilian casualties than conventional strike aircraft. But that isn't to say that those remote platforms are uninvolved in all of those other airstrikes. Far from it. And this diagram is a 
is an attempt to explain the central roles of predators and reapers in combat zones like Afghanistan. Primarily, they provide intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And they do this because they're equipped with full motion video, but also with a range of other sensors capable of providing signals intelligence. Now, what that package does is enable these aircraft to do two things. One is to recover the pattern of life of individuals on the ground, a pattern of life which is used typically to execute targeted killings, not only in Pakistan and Yemen and Somalia, but repeatedly in Afghanistan. And those targeted killings are certainly carried out by predators and reapers, but they're also carried out by conventional strike aircraft and crucially by special forces on the ground. So again, if you want to object to targeted killing, I'm with you all the way, but why single out those strikes carried out by drones? The second thing that predators and reapers are very good at doing through the provision of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance is providing what's sometimes called armed overwatch. That's to say, they are the eye in the sky looking out for troops on the ground, particularly when those troops come into contact with the Taliban and other insurgent groups. This is the provision of what's sometimes called close air support. And the strike that I'm going to talk about today combines both of those elements. That's to say, there is a pattern of life identified which is deemed to be suspicious. Now, to be sure, none of those involved know the identities of any of the people who will eventually be victims of the strike. So it resembles what's called a signature strike. But at the same time, it's made all the more urgent because of the very real fear that those who were struck were about to attack troops on the ground. So we need to understand then that targeted killing does take place in Afghanistan. And it's carried out not by the CIA, certainly not at its direction. It's carried out by the Pentagon. This is a strike storyboard which shows the targeted killing of one man carried out by a Reaper, codenamed Sky Raider. But many other platforms are involved too. This is another storyboard produced after an incident in which the killing was carried out by a combat helicopter, although much of the surveillance came from a remote platform. But what I want to focus on is the way in which those possibilities of targeted killing bleed into close air support, in which air power is used against targets that are deemed to be in close proximity to, to represent a threat to forces on the ground. Because those are the circumstances in which we know from this Human Rights Watch report, civilian casualties are most likely. So much so indeed that the unlikely figure of General McChrystal issued a tactical directive insisting that civilian casualties be minimized. We must avoid the trap of winning tactical victories, he wrote in 2009, but suffering strategic defeats by causing civilian casualties or excessive damage and thus alienating the people. So, with all of that in mind, about the eyes in the sky and the God trick, all that about targeted killing, close air support, and the role of remote platforms like the Predator and the Reaper, let's go granular and look at one strike. But we're going to look at it twice. Now this is the strike that everybody writes about. Gregoire Chamayou's theory of the drone begins with exactly this strike. Andrew Coburn's kill chain the rise of the high-tech assassins begins with exactly this strike. And everywhere you look, inside and outside the academy, this is the strike that is discussed again and again and again. And all of those discussions draw on a remarkable 
report by David S. McLeod, which appeared in the LA Times under the title, Anatomy of an Afghan War Tragedy. The bare story is this. In the early hours of the 21st of February 2010, a special, forces, a special Forces Detachment, known as an Operational Detachment Alpha, moved into the vicinity of a small village in Uruzgan province. They were tasked to carry out a cordon and search operation, and their intention was to find an IED factory. They were accompanied by contingents of the Afghan National Police and the Afghan National Army. They came in under the cover of darkness, and as they disembarked, their radios heard chatter from the Taliban. And an aircraft providing armed overwatch identified headlights moving in the north, but moving towards the village of Cod. The aircraft in question was an AC-130 gunship. We saw three distinct headlights and started to move around. That's when I talked to the folks in the sensors office, said the pilot, to see what they were. Then pretty quickly on the hour, we shifted to follow the trucks. Now, everything that they saw was transmitted to that operational detachment alpha on the ground by radio. And all of the communications with the AC-130 and all of the other aircraft which will be involved in the story passed through this man, the Joint Terminal Attack Controller. Now, it was the early hours of the morning. He could see very little. And in any case, those vehicles were beyond his line of sight. Ordinarily, he would have had a ruggedized laptop called a rover. But there was only one available. So they had to go out beyond the wire without any ability to capture the video being streamed from all of those aircraft in the sky. So they're reliant entirely upon radio contact. The AC-130 is joined by a Predator. The Predator had taken off from Kandahar Air Force Base, and then control had transferred to the pilots who flew the mission from Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. And they followed those vehicles through the early morning hours and into the dawn. This is a view of the sensor suite on board the AC-130. And you can see there that the captain of the aircraft says that the problem with their eyes in the sky is that they were not sharp enough to be able to provide positive identification. That's to say, to see what the people inside those vehicles were doing. Were they carrying weapons? And so all they could do was talk the Predator onto those three vehicles and then have the Predator track them. Because, as they explain, we cannot answer any questions about positive identification because our sensors don't have the fidelity. That's the kind of thing you get from an AC-130 using infrared vision at night. And so the Predator takes up the pursuit. And what we have here, taken directly from David McLeod's account, is the transcript of all of those radio communications between all of the aircraft involved and that joint terminal attack controller with the ground troops. Now you can see that they're having difficulty in identifying the target. They're juggling between what they call infrared and daytime TV. And they use the light of God, that laser beam, to fix the vehicles. And the object is to track those vehicles, to prosecute the target. And those legal terms are absolutely crucial in orchestrating the whole incident. You can see there, they talk about keeping the chain of custody. Now, all of those terms, of course, already identify what's happening as suspect. But the stakes are raised when you look at the language that starts to be used right the way through the pursuit, mediating that chain of custody. Two vehicles are joined by a third vehicle, and immediately they're described as a convoy. At one point in the night, the three trucks stop, 
people get out to pray. And the two men back at Creech Air Force Base watching this read that as a Taliban signifier. They're praying, they're praying. Praying, I mean seriously, that's what they do. And of course it's what every Muslim in Afghanistan does, including the Taliban. They're gonna do something nefarious. Again, they're juggling the fields of view, going from daytime TV to infrared and back again. Sweeten up the picture a bit, a real tight field of view. In other words, they can only get part of one truck into range at any one moment. Still can't get pristine focus on this, and suddenly they switch to daytime TV. That's about the best picture I've seen here all night. But it's far from perfect, and they track the vehicles through that extraordinary arid terrain, bumping and jolting over mountain roads through dried up wadis. There's a great discussion about who's inside those vehicles. They're described, as you can see, as mostly military-aged males. There's a discussion backwards and forwards about whether any children are present. There are potential adolescents, the video analysts, back in the United States, who are also looking at those feeds, suggest. When we say children, are we talking teenagers or toddlers? Asks the Joint Terminal Attack Control. I would say about 12, not toddlers, something more towards adolescence. Looks to be potential adolescence. We're thinking early teens. 12 to 13 years old with a weapon is just as dangerous. The Predator crew are ready to engage, but realize they only have one Hellfire missile left. That's not enough for three trucks. But they've already established that this is a convoy of military-aged males. Probably no children present. They're going to do something nefarious. So they're told that they will be reinforced by a Reaper, and they are not happy about it. They talk to them, both by radio and using internet relay chat. Much of their work consists not simply of looking at that screen ahead of them, the full motion video feed, but also the various chat rooms through which uh, secure conversations are conducted with all of the others watching their feed. But to the joy of the Predator crew, the Reaper is pulled off to another incident further to the south. So they're on their own, and they talk about how they wish they had another predator with them. A whole fleet of preds up here, ripple firing missiles, right and left, tee them all off to the same code. That would be badass. But we're not killers. We're ISR. As it happens, the attack is eventually carried out by two combat helicopters who are talked onto the target by the predator crew. And as the two helicopters disengage, and they look back at the wreckage, they start to notice not only destroyed vehicles, bodies, but survivors were in brightly colored clothes. And they realize that they must be women. And some of those figures scurrying outside the burnt out vehicles are too small to be adults. They're children. And so the crew on the flight deck of the Predator start to question the whole chain, not of custody, but of certainty that they gradually put in place through the night. Lorraine Bayard de Volo suggests that from omniscient vision, from the belief that they could see everything from their remote eyes in the sky, they backtrack into the fog of war. No way to tell from here says the sensor operator sitting next to the Predator pilot, excusing what's happened. That's a kid there to the left, says the pilot. Yeah, that's what they were calling the adolescent earlier. Mm. Adolescents don't move like that. And when the smoke had cleared, when the commander of the Special Operations Forces on the ground sent a team by helicopter to the strike site, they discovered 15 to 16 people had been killed and 12 people seriously injured. And they arranged immediately for the medical evacuation of the casualties. And it soon became clear 
They were all civilians. They were traveling together because they were fearful of an attack by the Taliban. They came from a tribe whose members, 3,000 of them, had been massacred by the Taliban several years earlier. They had good reason to fear, but they never imagined they had anything to fear from those eyes in the sky. Now, the response of Stanley McChrystal, having only recently issued his tactical directive, was to set up a military investigation headed by Major General Timothy McHale, supported by subject matter experts in ground combat in aviation and um, in special operations, and crucially, by a battalion of legal advisors. And their report was quite clear. The predator crew possessed a desire to engage inconsistent with evolving target actions. It wasn't just a chain of custody, it wasn't just a chain of certainty, but it was a hot trigger desire to engage. The predator crew sitting safely in Creech Air Force Base should be a dispassionate check on forces facing a dangerous situation. Instead, the most mature voice on the radio was the JTAC, the Joint Terminal Attack Controller, who was in harm's way on the ground. But remember, could see nothing, was reliant entirely on those eyes in the sky telling him what was happening. It was the predator crew's lack of professionalism in their communication, coordination, and behavior which contributed to a faulty threat assessment by the ground commander. And in fact, one of the captains at Creech Air Force Base gave the game away. Everyone around here, it's like Top Gun. Everyone has the desire to do our job, employ weapons against the enemy. They were thinking, hell yeah, we want to help out and be part of this. And the pilot of the Predator, like so many of these remote crews, insisted that in the moment, he wasn't 7,500 miles away from what was happening on the ground, just 18 inches away, the distance from eye to screen. Insofar as that cheap and ignorant shot about this reducing war to a video game has any truth, it is, of course, that video games are immersive. And those watching those screens are immersed in the situation. I do experience stuff along with the guys on the ground. I definitely care about them. I would say I'm in that situation with them, just trying to support them the best I can. That's the standard story. Most recently, explored by Jamie Allenson, an essay in International Political Sociology, who describes all of the people I've just been talking about quite properly as the US military kill chain. And he enumerates the operational detachment alpha on the ground, the drone operators at Creech, the screeners processing those uh, video feeds at Herbert Air Force Base, and the pilots of the helicopter gunships who carried out the attack. But you see, all of that is based on the transcript of those radio communications, which was published in the LA Times. None of it is based on the 2,000 pages of the official investigation. Now, it's not easy to read those two together. The transcript was part of that investigation, and there are all sorts of problems in reading them together. Obviously, they are records constructed at different times. Uh, there are multiple narratives. There are all sorts of different points of view, jostling and colliding. There are all sorts of disjunctions. It's a redacted report. And there are all sorts of inconsistencies, which I have to say, the investigating team ferry out with forensic energy. It's inflected by rank and by <coughs> military chain of command, by deference to those above, and by a series of orders issued to those below. And these are not dispassionate records of what happened. Uh, they're shot through with affect. But still, when you put that fuller record into play, what you discover is the kill chain is not limited to those actors identified by Jamie Allenson, and to be fair, everybody else who writes about what happened. It also includes these actors. Crucially, people on the ground in Afghanistan at two command bases. One, Special Operations Task Force 12 in Kandahar to the south, and the other, above them, the Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force at Bagram to the north. So what happens when we bring them into the picture? Well, let's revisit the story. Down in Kandahar, 
everything that was taking place was being monitored by the Special Operations Task Force, by a young officer, inexperienced with minimal training, the night battle captain. And all he did was watch. We have a complete record made through the night in meticulous bureaucratic detail about what was happening. But as you can see, he told the inquiry, I just monitored and saw what happened. I didn't feel at that point it was necessary to wake anyone because all of his senior officers, remember he's young and inexperienced, guess where they were? They were asleep. And guess when special forces do most of their operations? At night. The same story, the Bagram to the north. He was asked, the major, monitoring operations through the night. As the night operations director, what's the responsibility of the ops director with respect to situational awareness? We were plotting, sir, by which he means tracking everything on the screen and plotting it on maps. Now, this is a tense, complicated, and crowded situation. They decide to bring in more aircraft. The first aircraft they bring in after the AC-130 gunship and after the Predator is on station, before the helicopters are mobilized, are what they call fast movers. Call sign Dude-01. And those fast movers are exactly what they say. You can't see very much from one of those aircraft, but you can sure as hell hear them on the ground. And the ground force commander, as soon as he hears them, is furious. I have fast movers over my station. My desire is to have rotary wing aircraft, which is to say helicopters. They were afraid that the noise would, as they put it, burn the target. And as it happens, at exactly the moment that those jet aircraft came on station, those three vehicles diverted. They turned away from the village of Cod and started to head west, as you can see on this map. But that was immediately interpreted as tactical maneuvering. Because after all, it's a convoy. They prey their military-aged males. And so the fact that they're moving away from the special forces on the ground is not seen as a reduction of threat. Quite the opposite. It just shows how cunning and crafty they are. Tactical maneuvering. So you can't win. You see, you approach them head on, and you're a threat. You veer away, you're an even more dangerous and sneaky threat. All this is also being watched by those screeners back in the United States, video analysts, a whole army of them. Three full motion video analysts, two screeners, and a geospatial analyst, watching the feed from the Predator, but also tracking out from that soda straw view using both Google Earth and something called Falcon View to provide a wider sense of what's going on. While all this is going on, while people at different locations are trying to make sense of what's going on, most urgently, of course, those on the ground who have been fed information to make them think they're under threat, while they're being watched from Bagram and Kandahar, the helicopters have been called in. Here they are, call sign Bam Bam 41. <coughs> the pilot of the Predator says, well, the Hellos are going to take out as much as they can. They have the primary responsibility for destroying the target. And when they Winchester, which is to fire, we can play cleanup. Now, while all this is going on, what is so extraordinary is you can see here that the day battle captain, that young man in the south, is doing nothing. There's no record of him doing anything for two hours. And as soon as the night battle captain goes off duty and is replaced by the day battle captain, an experienced officer, he immediately calls in a military lawyer. I sent a runner to ask the military lawyer, the JAG, to come into the ops and help us review what we're seeing and to put it into his own eyes. I didn't feel that the ground force commander would use any kind of close air support whatsoever. Based on the information that I had, looking at the vehicles move away from, from it, did not appear that they were moving towards the ground forces. So he's reading the situation in a radically different way to the ground force commander. The lawyer agrees, Captain Brad Cowan. I was concentrating on watching the Predator feed. He had a copy of the rules of engagement, the crystals, tactical directive. I was making notes on them. I don't know what the helicopter pilots could see, but I could see what the Predator was seeing, and I didn't see anything in that video feed that would indicate a hostile act 
hostile intention. Preeminent in my mind, he said, was the need to avoid civilian casualties. So he persuades those who just come on duty in Kandahar to arrange for two other helicopters to appear and carry out what's called an armed vehicle interdiction. That's to say, to come in low and stop those three vehicles, ideally without firing a shot, to find out exactly who was in them and what they were doing. But at that point, the phone rings because the commanding officer in Bagram has been woken up. He's come into that op center, he looks at the Predator screen and wants to know why the hell they haven't fired. I asked SOTF-12, did we drop? No, why not? The element is 10 kilometers away, approaching our location. He misreads the Predator feed. So I went to call, I don't want to wait until they're on top of our guys. Let's not wait until those forces get on top of our guys to take it out. Now he concedes under cross-examination that he misread the predator feed. He says he has no way, looking at the predator feed, to know which way those trucks are moving because it's such a narrow field of view. Where the officers tell him, ha, huh, well you see that little icon at the bottom of the screen, that tells you which way it's moving. Oh, I missed that, he says. And they explain in great detail why that matters. This is not a threat, it's moving away, and his syntax collapses. I will take a hit on that. I should have, you know, hey, let's open this thing up. Let me see the target, the objective, where the vehicle's going. And so, but I didn't. Kind of Trump-esque response. <laughs> Meanwhile, they decide that they are going to go ahead with this aerial vehicle interdiction. They're getting phone calls from people who actually, as it were, own the second set of helicopters, and they are prepared to bring them in and carry out the aerial vehicle interdiction. But what they've forgotten is that two other helicopters were already en route. Two other helicopters which have been fully briefed on this as a threat landscape. This is the mission brief map, which identifies IED hotspots, insurgent activity, uh, insurgent spotter locations, insurgent safe havens, insurgent fighting positions. They see this as a landscape of threat already. And they're being talked onto the target by a predator which has seen this as a hostile force. The Predator was the main source of all the identification we got. But of course, says the helicopter pilot, we couldn't see their feed. Now, of course, they had their own visual capacity on board. But as you can see, it's a degraded <coughs> infrared uh, image. It's supposed to be a high-resolution camera. But you can see just the blurring from uh, their mast mounted sight. What could they see with their eyes as dawn broke? Well, this is what they could see. So virtually everyone has different views, distorted views, views which it's incredibly difficult to make sense of. But the pilot of the Predator is ready to go in and mop up after the helicopters have struck. As long as you keep something we can shoot in the field of view, he says, I'm happy. Now the helicopters ideally say they would go in low to get a clear identification of the vehicles and who's in them. But they've already been told they mustn't burn the target. So they go in and fire. Cool looking shot. He's clear to engage, so he has type three. So the JTAC on the ground with the ground forces has cleared them hot to engage. Type three means that he can see neither the aircraft nor the target. He's relying entirely on what he's being told by the predator. And it has to be said that all of those watching elsewhere were astonished. The day battle captain said everyone in the op center was immediately shocked by phones ringing left and right, talking to people, trying to explain things, trying to arrange that aerial vehicle interdiction with two other helicopters, when we look up on the screen and it happened. Exactly the same with the screamers back at Hurlbut Field in the continental United States. Once the vehicle started moving away, they thought the threat was over. Their commander came back into the room and was suddenly told that they went kinetic on those vehicles. And he too 
was taken aback. That's the video of the strike. And there, the imagery from the ground of all those civilians killed. So what can we conclude from that? Well, of course, I've taken all kinds of shortcuts. It's 2,000 pages. But what strikes me is that most of the discussion about drone operations focuses on this circuit in which the drone is launched from close to the target area, control reaches back via a Q-band satellite and a fiber optic cable to the continental United States, and its video is then distributed to video analysts who are designed to back up what the pilot and sensor operator is seeing. And we find Brad Evans talking about uh, drone technologies are not simply a new tool of warfare that allow for legal or strategic reassessment. What takes its place is an atmospheric gaze that further eviscerates the human. Um, I think that's wholly wrong and spectacularly ignorant. Because drones can only be used in uncontested airspace. It's the first reason. Drones are slow, sluggish, and noisy. They're easy to shoot down. You can't use them over Russia or China because they'd be shot down. So you can only use them against people that can't fight back. That much is true. The human is eviscerated. But it means that you're going to use them, for the most part, over ground, which is contested. And what matters is not simply the atmospheric gains, but precisely what is happening on the ground. And when we look at what is happening on the ground, what we find are, in this particular instance, a whole series of different chains of command. Special operations, you see, operate outside ISAF. They were part of Operation Enduring Freedom. It's under the auspices of Operation Enduring Freedom that that inquiry was set up. The reason that matters is that they have different rules of engagement. And more to the point, they do not coordinate their activities with regular ISAF forces. Regular ISAF troops have little control of the actions of US Special Forces coming into their areas, says Chris Woods, yet they were left to deal with the consequences. So they were. Those attack helicopters came from ISAF. The helicopters that came in to carry out the medical evacuation of the casualties on the ground were ISAF. Here's the commander of ISAF's Regional Command South. It's not acceptable, he told the inquiry, that someone can ship on my doorstep and sit back and watch me mop the ship up. So you have tangled chains of command. It's an intensely bureaucratic process. It's not simply the lust for blood of the predator crew. Secondly, we can look at the video stream. And what we find is that everyone who looked at the video stream after the event said, well, it's obvious they're civilians. But the real question is, what was it possible to know, disabusing ourselves of the god trick, before the strike, before the inquiry? And what you see, except on the part of the Predator crew, is radical uncertainty. All of those others watching were far from clear what they were seeing on the screen. And that's partly, I think, because the view was so constricted. It's also a result of a whole series of technical difficulties. What we find is the field of view is constantly changing. Interruptions to the video feed make it difficult. The screen goes fuzzy. You can't bring things into clear focus. And the quality of those feeds differs spectacularly from site to site. Because those video feeds place a huge demand on satellite bandwidth, the only way you can move them to so many places, to have so many different eyes on the ground looking at the sky, is if you degrade and compress the video feed. So the quality of those feeds differs significantly from place to place. That's the military lawyer. I saw the predator feed being transmitted onto the wall. The resolution was fairly poor. The night NCO in charge says that ISR literally looks at, the, looks, look at this rug right here. That's what ISR looks like. It's fuzzy. It's blurry. Even the video analysts who are required to make sense of those feeds, so there's only so much we can do because the quality of our full motion video is not great. And so 
one of the majors responsible in those task forces says, we didn't have eyes on minus ISR platform, but we can all see who watches what. All the discrepancies between who watches what. What I see may be different from what someone else might interpret on the ISR. ISR isn't reliable, it's simply a video platform. Peter Asaro puts it, the fact that the members of this team all have access to high resolution imagery in the same situation does not mean they all see the same thing. And what we've got is a decentralized, distributed, and dispersed field of militarized vision, whose fields of view expand, contract, and even close at different locations. Donna Harry was absolutely right. Dog trick is impossible. And in very many ways, multiplying these points of view doesn't produce a transparent battle space. It makes it even murkier, because there are even more voices providing different interpretations of what's happened. And bear in mind, finally, that those full motion video feeds are silent. Nasser Hussein captures this wonderfully when he says there's no microphone equivalent to the microscopic gaze of the drone's camera. These are like ghost figures moving. The only sound is the radio. So the only communication is with troops on the ground. So I suspect the reason that those predator crews lean forward and are so anxious to engage is that they know full well they're not on the ground in Afghanistan, even though they feel they are. And I think it's that distance translated into a form of martialized guilt which impels them to intervene in situations where many others looking at that screen, including people on the ground in Afghanistan, would prefer to hold back. And so finally, angry eyes. This has to be the worst country western song ever written by Kenny Loggins. Um, <laughs> ostensibly not about drone strikes, but given everything I've said, look at those lyrics. Time, time and again, I've seen you staring at me. I bet you wish you could cut me down with those angry eyes. You want to believe that I'm not the same as you. You see, it's a bifurcated visual field in which the predator crew identifies with the troops on the ground, but is predisposed to regard everything that happens around them as hostile. You want to believe I'm not the same as you. What a shot you could be if you could shoot at me with those angry eyes, when I mean the deadly aim of those angry eyes. Thank you.